This is a presentation of the Center for Advanced Study at the University of Illinois. For over 50 years, the Center for Advanced Study has brought together scholars from diverse disciplines and backgrounds, encouraging and rewarding excellence in all areas of academic inquiry at Illinois, one of the nation's premier public universities. For more information about this presentation and other center activities, please visit cas.illinois.edu. Our speaker today, the Oxford-educated philosopher Colin McGinn, is one of the world's leading thinkers on the nature and limits of consciousness. And as a public intellectual, he, more than any figure since Bertrand Russell, has made the problems of philosophy accessible to general educated audiences. In 2002, HarperCollins published his autobiography, The Making of a Philosopher, My Journey Through 20th Century Philosophy. It went on to become an international bestseller. At the time, McGinn was the ripe old age of 51. His launch from academe to the international intellectual scene was occasioned by a 1989 article that first appeared in the analytic philosophy journal Mind, titled, Can We Solve the Mind-Body Problem? His startling answer was, no, we can't. <laughs> that there are certain areas of consciousness that are inaccessible to consciousness itself. The blockage, he proposes, is the result of evolutionary biology. Just as it's not in the cards of natural selection for star-nosed moles to read Greek, so too it's not in our cards to solve, for instance, the problem of free will, of how the freedom that rational agents have can exist in the wholly deterministic world of atoms and the void. The reason that philosophers have knocked themselves on the head for centuries over this problem, basically getting nowhere the while, is that there's nowhere to go. Many potential objects of thought, or so argues McGinn, could only actually be thought if the hard wiring for our minds were configured differently than it is for the minds we, by nature, actually have. Though the basic idea is as old as Kant, reason has its limits, McGinn's version of it struck most contemporary philosophers as heretical. For it meant that in our striving to become like God, however things might be chugging along with the omnipotence project, the omniscience project had to be abandoned. But the popular press was as intrigued as the philosophers were shocked, and the rest, as they say, is history. Since that time, McGinn has expounded to the wider world his ideas on metaphysics, consciousness, ethics, film, and literature, not just through books, though he has published 20 of them, seven on Oxford University Press alone, but through television and movies as well. In 2004, the brothers Wachowski chose him again to elucidate in the documentary Return to Source the philosophy behind their Matrix trilogy. McGinn unpacks the theme of illusion and reality in the Matrix and the theme of free will and determinism in the Matrix Reloaded. The same year, McGinn was featured in the BBC television series Jonathan Miller's Brief History of Disbelief, and in a testament to McGinn's clarity and charm, Miller used an interview with him to kick off the follow-up documentary, The Atheism Tapes, which also featured interviews with Richard Dawkins, Daniel Dennett, Steven Weinberg, and Arthur Miller. McGinn has appeared on PBS programs on The Great Apes Project, and in 2006, he was heavily featured in Bill Moyer's PBS television series, Faith and Reason. In addition to being a prolific author of books, McGinn is one of the gatekeepers of the humanities and social sciences in his role as a book reviewer, a sometimes scathing one. Scores of his reviews have appeared in the Times Literary Supplement, the London Review of Books, the New Republic, the New York Review of Books, Slate, the Wall Street Journal, the Los Angeles Times, the Washington Post, and the New York Times Book Review. In 2008, the New York Times even devoted a feature article to McGinn's acerbic yet incandescent reviewing prowess. 
Given the breadth of McGinn's interests, it's not surprising that today's talk has collected a healthy number of co-sponsors. For their support, I would like to thank the Beckman Institute, the College of Medicine and its Medical Scholars Program, the Neuroscience Program, the Institute for Genomic Biology, the Department of Religion, the School of Literatures, Cultures, and Linguistics, the Department of Educational Psychology, the Department of the Classics, the Program in Comparative and World Literatures, the Unit for Criticism, the Program in Science and Technology Studies, the Departments of Psychology, Sociology, Political Science, and Anthropology, the Department of Theater, the Departments of English and French, the Program in Jewish Culture and Society, the Departments of Slavic and Germanic Languages and Literatures, the Gender and Women's Studies Program, That's for Entertainment, the Department of Etymology, <laughs> and its annual Insect Fear Film Festival and the Department of Media and Cinema Studies. Given that McGinn has recently published two books on the nature and importance of sports, perhaps I should have approached the Athletic Association, but I didn't want to press my luck. The chief sponsor for today's talk is the Department of Philosophy. Philosophy, the de the today's talk, beyond its status as a Millercom lecture, also serves two additional functions, as the philosophy department's annual public lecture and the keynote address for the department's 32nd annual graduate student conference, the longest running by far of the numerous such conferences in the country. You are invited to a presentation that McGinn will be giving tomorrow to the conference. The paper is titled simply, Physics and Psychology. It's on how the two disciplines differ in their approach to basic concepts and will be held at 10.30 a.m. in 319 Gregory Hall. Today's talk extends McGinn's work on mental attitudes and bodily states into the realm of the emotions. He informs me that this is the maiden voyage for the lecture. It's titled, Disgust and Death. Colin. Uh, well, thank you, Richard, for that uh, wonderfully comprehensive uh, introduction in which you managed to cover even my uh, sporting interests. And it's true to say that my main interest in life is tennis, basically, as well as water sports, but I, I also am a philosopher. Um, and thank you to the Millicom uh, Committee for inviting me to give this uh, prestigious lecture. Uh, and uh, the subject matter perhaps um, will require me to give you a warning before we start, rather like those warnings that you see on TV, on HBO, when it says um, uh, mature content, strong language, and so forth. Uh, the subject I'm discussing is inherently a disturbing one uh, for everybody, um, uh, but if I'm going to discuss it, I have to discuss it uh, you know, clearly and straightforwardly and using the appropriate uh, language to discuss it. Uh, it's part of a book that I've been writing about disgust. In fact, this is the second part. The first part was more about uh, all the different disgust objects there are and why they all are uh, disgusting and what, what they share in common, which required me to go through a list of disgusting things. And, and so I thought I wouldn't subject you to that. I'd subject you more to uh, an application of, of that in a, in a rather broader context. And that's what I'm going to do today. Um, I, since I think that uh, our attitudes about um, ourselves are repressed, um, I'll be working against your repressions. And if you feel it necessary to release your repressions by laughter, I would encourage you to do it. And there are not many jokes, but you'll see why I, I say that as we, as we proceed. The subject is very close, actually, to humor in many ways, and, and I'm sure that's obvious to you even before I begin. Uh, I'm going to actually begin with a uh, quotation from... Um, uh, from uh, Nietzsche. Um, somebody's messed up my papers here, I can see, so I now have to find where I was. Um, if I can find the quotation from Nietzsche. Yes, and here I... Actually, I almost messed up my papers too much, so I know where I am. Yes. Um, this will get you in the mood. Um, so, here's Nietzsche. The aesthetically insulting at work in the inner human without skin, bloody masses muck bowels, viscera, all those sucking, pumping monstrosities, formless or ugly or grotesque, painful for the smell to boot. Hence, away with it in thought. What still does emerge excites shame. This body concealed by the skin, as if in shame. Hence, there is disgust exciting matter. 
the more ignorant humans are about their organism, the lesser can they distinguish between raw meat, rot, stink, maggots, to the extent that he is not a gestalt. The human being is disgusting to himself. He does everything not to think about it. So I'm not going to write in the same mode as Nietzsche, but it will get you. You see what the subject matter is. Okay. Um, Descartes uh, divides the human person into two parts, corresponding to mind and body. The essence of mind is thought. The essence of body is extension. Mind is exempt from the reach of, of mechanism, but body is subject to mechanism. This means that the human body is classified along with other extended bodies, such as machines and purely inanimate things in general. Physics can treat all extended bodies equally, including the human body. When we think of our bodies as extended, we think of them as belonging with other bodies, mechanical or geological or astronomical. Mechanism has long since lapsed as the theory of the physical world, but still the tendency has been to conceive the human body as continuous with other physical bodies. From one point of view, this is not wrong but it serves to obscure an important fact about the human body so far as our effective relation to it is concerned, namely that it's an organic biological system. There is nothing disgusting about machines and mountains and stars, but the human body, like organic systems generally, has the talent to disgust. We do not think of ourselves, as in the famous phrase, the ghost in the machine, not only, not only because we don't think of ourselves as ghostly, that is immaterial or incorporeal, but also because we don't think of our human body as a machine, if that means similar to a human artifact, such as a car or a robot. Our attitude towards machines and organic bodies is quite different. Descartes' picture omits this crucial difference and so fails to record the very special relationship we have with our bodies. The simple point is that we are disgusting by our bodily nature, not, merely as a merely, not as a merely extended thing, but as an organic thing, a thing with what I call plumbing. Descartes' philosophy omits the anus. His view of the body is dryly antiseptic and abstract. The extendedness of the body is not an emotional issue for us as intelligent conscious beings, but the disgustingness of the body is. We might say that the body exhibits a certain dualism itself between its non-disgusting properties, such as extension and movement, and its disgusting ones, such as digestion and bloodiness. If we are to understand our feelings about ourselves, the latter are crucial. Descartes' dualism represents a reification of an undeniable duality. One aspect of our nature attracts such labels as soul, spirit, self, mind, personhood, and consciousness. When we think of ourselves in this way, collateral concepts and categories are brought to bear. We are described as symbolic, or normative, or rational, or self-conscious, or free, or cultural, or reflective, or even transcendent. On this side belong our ethical and aesthetic senses, as well as our intellectual powers and linguistic abilities. We value this side of ourselves, even comparing it to the attributes of divine beings. In this self-congratulatory mode, we think of ourselves as godlike and make invidious comparisons between humans and other animals. But we must also acknowledge another side which, that excites far less admiration, the side relate, relating to the body. This side we characterize with such expressions as organic, animal, creaturely, biological, law-governed, decomposable, finite, abject, ghastly. Attitudes here can range from the outright hostile to the mildly critical. Irresistibly, this side of our nature is described as lower, not something to celebrate or boast about, still less to liken to the godlike. On the one hand, then, we have what we might call an heroic nature, while on the other we have a nature that is, well, less than heroic, subheroic maybe. And these two natures exist side by side in uneasy juxtaposition, the godlike and the, shall we say, animal-like. The former attracts admiration, but the latter is mired in disgust because the organic body excites disgust. One part of us is disgusted by the other part, the good part by the bad part. To be more concrete, he who has a soul also has an anus. He who thinks shits, and there cannot be the former without the latter. The fine part of our nature is dependent upon the gross part, the higher on the lower, the rarefied on the squalid. We cannot cast off our gross nature, like an old skin, because without it we can have no existence at all. No cosmetic surgery can remove the disgustingness from our identity. For example, it attaches to all of our internal organs. Moreover, the disgusting, the disgusting continually confronts the fine with its inescapable quiddity. We are tied to it epistemologically as well as ontologically. We are disgusting and we know it, yet we feel ourselves to be much more than that and to exist outside of it. 
There is a corner of our being that is free of all disgust, the part we call the self or even the soul. The person seems to incorporate too much of the body, so we don't use that to, to designate this part of ourselves. Indeed, we might be thought to have concocted the idea of the soul precisely in order to carve out a section of our being that is not touched by the disgusting, a kind of pure kernel. We are saturated with gross materials in our bodily nature, yet feel that there is something in us that transcends those materials. So we contrive a notion of soul that is stipulated to be innocent of all disgust elements, to stand quite outside the organic realm, akin to the divine, so that when we die, all of the disgusting elements are left behind and the soul goes on in its non-disgusting purity. The concept of the divine itself seems specially designed to avoid the disgustingness of biological nature, and we reserve a place for ourselves in this charmed sphere by identifying a divine ingredient in our nature. The soul is that part of the human being that has no tincture of disgust clinging to it, and so it cannot be identified with anything like a heart or a brain, which are quite disgusting things, still less with the entire biological system. At any rate, the human animal presents itself to itself as an amalgam of the disgusting and the heroic, as I've styled it. We experience ourselves as, ourselves as occupying both dimensions simultaneously and inextricably. At one moment, the human being repels himself. At another, he excites his own admiration. We esteem ourselves for our spiritual side, and yet we despise ourselves for our foul and filthy side. Thus, our being as human beings can be described as paradoxical, incongruous, dissonant, divided, contradictory, hybrid, mismatched, ambiguous, bipolar. We are a synthesis of opposites, a compound of disparate elements. Our emotional reaction to ourselves reflects this incongru incongruity, love and hate, attraction and repulsion, narcissism and despair. Divine, divine poetic utterance issues mellifluously, mellifluously from the petal-like lips, while at the same time a pungent fart escapes the anus like some mocking demon of the digestive system. Here's where you might titter a little thinking of that. The two, the two sides of our nature are fused, yet each pulls in its own direction, pointing a finger at the other. Our fine side deplores our gross side, while our gross side seems intent on dragging down our fine side. We, humans, are caught in the middle. Animals and children feel no such ambivalence about their nature, because disgust is foreign to them. The duality in question has no hold over their thoughts and feelings. The gods also suffer no such qualms, because there's nothing about them to disgust, not having an organic nature. Only human beings, of all the creatures of the natural and supernatural world, feel this awkward split, this wretched dissonance. We are, as has been well said, the god who shits, and we are only too well aware of our unique status. In another image, we are philosopher worms, or worms that philosophize. Trapped in our grossness, we nevertheless aspire to great things and even achieve them. We feel greatness within ourselves, a divine spark, yet at the same time we are flooded with the sordidness of our nature as organisms. We exist as a kind of ontological oxymoron. Consciousness itself encourages the sense of a divided nature at war with itself. Consciousness is not the kind of thing that can disgust the senses. It would be a category mistake to attribute physical disgustingness to consciousness, to thoughts, sensations, feelings and acts of will. Consciousness strikes us as transcending the organic, negating it. It gives us the illusion that we are not constitutionally disgusting. If we knew only facts about our own conscious minds, we could never deduce that we are also a gross bag of biological tissue. This is why we are perpetually surprised by our gross nature, taken aback by it, as we are not by our rational nature. Simply by being a centre of consciousness, who would ever guess that he or she is also a perishable envelope of ghastly goo with leaking holes in it? We feel a proper pride in the achievements of the human mind, we seem to belong so intimately to us, but this is coupled with dismay about the squelchy organism we also turn out to be, which seems to exist at one remove from our essence. That's why Descartes and others thought the essence of the person was the mind and not the body. That's the, our very core. Consciousness strikes us immediately as a non-disgusting zone of reality, but then we discover that we are also enmeshed in another zone consisting of gross biological material. A priori, we know ourselves to be pure and clean in our conscious core, but a posteriori, we find that we also wallow in filth. As it were, the self-assured nobleman discovers he has humble and detestable beginnings. There is grime beneath the surface sheen of the conscious mind. Given that we are essentially conscious being, beings then, as well as biological entities, we are existentially condemned to experience ourselves as both clean and unclean, wonderful and sordid, dignified and undignified. The very nature of consciousness introduces the split in our nature I am harping on. 
In an insentient worm, for example, there is no such split, because such a being is disgusting through and through. There's no compartment of its being that's exempt from the reach of disgust. There's no soul there. Sentient organisms, by contrast, contain a disgust-free sector where their minds are located. Self-conscious beings, such as us, recognize that their minds are, in this sense, pure, but then they must also acknowledge that their bodies are vile, and this acknowledgement comes as an existential shock, a trauma from which no recovery is possible. It is surely a stunning discovery, and not a very welcome one, that pure rarefied consciousness has its basis in that pulpy, sponge-like growth we call the brain. That is not at all what we would have expected, viewing the conscious mind purely from the inside. The organic brain is the last thing we would have expected to form the basis of the mind. And the shock here is not just ontological, it's also emotional. For the brain is just so revolting to the senses. It resembles nothing so much as a mound of blood-flecked dung. From the inside, consciousness gives a quite different account of itself, thus engendering an illusion about the kind of being we are. Our inherent duality only becomes apparent when we assume the outside perceptual point of view and take in the body and its horrors. Negative emotions thus coexist with positive ones. In unresolved confusion and profusion, we cringe in our bodily nature, becoming self-critical, self-loathing, ashamed, beset by anxiety about the betrayals it may visit on us. Much effort is made to conceal, to minimize, and to protect. All of culture can, can be thought of in that way. It seems like an insult, or a joke, or a tragedy, or all three. Who would play such a trick on us? Yet on the other side, there is pride, self-esteem, self-worship, grandiosity. The human condition is to be subject to these contrary emotions, pulled in both directions, a divided self. Disgusting and delightful together, we vacillate and hesitate, we worry and fret. Are we great or are we wretched? The only answer seems to be both. If only we could become united beings, all body or all spirit, but that seems out of the question. We may strive to transcend our biological nature by accentuating our finer nature, by art, by religion, by science, but it remains stubbornly in place and the basis of all transcendence. We cannot purify a being, our being, no matter how hard we try. We shall always be loathsome and nauseating. No amount of heroism can ever free us from the necessity to produce, with mindless regularity, pound after pound and ton upon ton, of stinking, revolting, vomit-making shit. No matter how much we admire or love another human being, we can never free ourselves of revulsion at what they are or can easily become, a rotting corpse or sup suppurating mass. Jonathan Swift, a famous poet, could not even free himself of Celia, his beloved's, shocking but common bathroom acts. And that was the, the, before he even considered the question of her possible incontinence. The lines from Swift, as you may know, uh, go roughly as, follow, as follows. I am at the end of all my wits for Celia, 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 shits. And he couldn't, <laughs> could not reconcile himself to that. And he expanded on the problem. Um, Sartre, uh, Sartre maintained that we are condemned to consciousness of our own freedom, which we try desperately to escape, and it produces angst. I am saying that we are condemned to consciousness of our own filth, which we also want desperately to escape. Disgust is a highly disagreeable emotion, and its prime object is ourselves. This is not a situation we can ever be happy with. And there is a further immensely disquieting fact. Our very survival as a self or soul depends upon the body we find so disgusting. It's not just the fact that we die that disturbs us, but that our death is in the hands of a loathsome and alien mass of tissues. If the bowels cease to perform their gruesome work, it's lights out for the transcendent soul that frets about its proximity to the organic body. We need the thing from which we are so alienated. The soul may despise the organs of the body and would never accept any claim of deep kinship between itself and them. Yet its very existence depends upon those despised organs, their pumping and squirting. It's like having to accept that all our finer feelings and achievements depend upon a vile nest of writhing worms that mindlessly go about their gruesome business of consuming and excreting. This seems particularly insulting, forcing us to feed these worms that we can hardly stand the sight of on pain of ceasing to exist, we have to feed our own worm, our intestine. We are embedded in the repugnant, unable to survive without it. Where is our dignity? The body can seem like a foul prison we cannot live without. Only death can release us from the disgusting, but life, but life is saturated with it. This seems both unfair and incomprehensible. Unfair because an affront to our finer nature, and incomprehensible because it seems like a senseless contingency, nature out of joint. It's, and, and it is all because of our incongruous duality. Let's consider the matter diachronically. 
Organic bodies evolved on the planet, on planet Earth, long before anything like a self-reflective self did. Many millions of years, in fact, before that. The design of these bodies was clearly not arrived at by consultation with such self-reflective and aesthetically sensitive beings as ourselves. Above the level of plant life, the basic architecture of life is a tubular structure that takes in nourishment at one end and expels waste products at the other, a worm in short. Different body structures developed around this worm-like tube to enable mobility and the like, but all animals are structured as organs and tissues surrounding a central, a central digestive, tra digestive tract, humans included. For millions of years, no one, none of the animals, battered, battered an eyelid. The various species of animal felt no repugnance at the, at the design nature had laid down. And what other design possibilities did nature have? I mean, how else could you set up a, a living system? It has to take in energy, it has to expel waste. The dinosaurs led a disgust free existence, idyllic in its way. But then, very late in the day, after eons of organic life, a species evolved, us, that regarded organic life quite differently, a queasy, weak-stomached, hypersensitive species. And this species found the constitution of the animal body an object of distaste and, and disdain. In certain circumstances, this species, Homo disgusticus, we might say, would even vomit when the body underwent one of its routine performances. Thus was born the first and only self-loathing species on the planet, the one that found biological reality itself to be abhorrent. And, and to see it from their point of view, this was not really all that surprising, since they, after all, were beings endowed with an aesthetic sense, and the animal body had never been vetted by anyone with such a sense. Certain sensibilities had evolved in this new species, but the body that housed them had not been devised with these sensibilities in mind. A certain clash inevitably resulted. The basic body design was an inflexible biological given that had stood the test of evolutionary time. But that is not to say that a creature with a fine sense of the beautiful and the ugly would find that design to its liking. Natural selection woke up one day to discover that it had given a vile body a refined mind. Up until that point, the various species had all been indifferent Philistines compared to us. But it was too late now because the, the body design was, was, was what it was and the refined minds could see things in no other way. Once culture got seriously underway, the disgust factor only deepened. But the bodies didn't change. It was like it or lump it. The refined, the refined species dreamed of, other, dreamed of other purer bodies and even made small steps toward their creation, uh, which only made their predicament worse, of course, but the die was cast. Was there a way out of this predicament? Theoretically, yes. At least the thought of a way out was available in the form of metamorphosis. The unprepossessing caterpillar, itself a type of worm, could change into the beautiful butterfly, so nature had allowed for dramatic bodily transformations from the relatively disgusting to the relatively beautiful. In principle, then, the psychological novelties introduced by man, for that was the disgusted species name that I was just referring to, could have been accompanied by suitable physical transformations. The body could have evolved to be more congenial to the mind, or there could have been a period where it metamorphosed into something more congenial to itself. This possibility of metamorphosis occasioned a good deal of resentment in the mind of man, because, because clearly nature had been too lazy or ill-willed to arrange it. It left them the task instead of simply, as they say, sucking it up. They just had to accept it, no matter how confused and miserable it left them. Of course, the practical problems about arranging such a sudden metamorphosis were much larger than our resentful species supposed, and there was no precedent for it, but they were also an impatient and thoughtless species in many ways, so there was no arguing with them. Also, in the case of the butterfly, it was much less simple than they made it seem because if you examine the butterfly closely, it was by no means as lovely as legend had it, especially once you look past the wings at the stick-like ab ad abdomen and its squishy content. In fact, the idea of a disgust-free animal body was really a fantasy, cooked up by a species that refused to accept that digestion was a simple fact of biological life. That English writer, Mr. Swift, seemed particularly dense on the point. What on earth did he expect of his beloved Cecilia? I mean, he was surprised that Cecilia had to do that thing. It wasn't at all clear that nature, or anyone else, I put capital A, capital E, could have done much else to improve the disgust value of the human body, given the basic parameters of life. Once the, once the perceptual and emotional apparatus of disgust is in place, organic life is bound to activate it. Still, the abstract notion of metamorphosis haunted man and made him strain at the bit of his biological heritage. And there was no denying the point that bodies had not been designed with refined minds in mind. The more those minds progressed, the more sensitive they became. 
and their rate of progress was very fast compared to evolutionary change. The, the, and the more, that the, the more their rate of progress was very fast, and as they did that, the more the bodies seemed to lag behind, mocking the pretensions of the minds that subsisted within them. We got cleaner and cleaner, we, had, we adopted more ways to beautify ourselves and so on, but uh, still we didn't manage to solve the problem. In an instant, man was, defining, was de demanding, I don't know when this would have started in the history of man, toilet facilities and privacy and soap and water and air fresheners and deodorants, while the anus, as a biological organ, and its adjuncts just plodded on as usual. They didn't change, they just do, do what they did. We tried to work around that. At a late stage of his evolution, man developed, and here I speculate about the future, ever more ingenious ways to improve, as he saw it, the manners of his body, even devising, I'm guessing, a system for removing, by a kind of selective teletransportation, waste matter from the, from the digestive process before, before it ever reached the large intestine thus eliminating the need for defecation at all, and with it the anus, there's no don't need it anymore. So we, the waste just disappeared from inside the body to be recycled as building materials, let's say. It's just selective teletransportation, so you, toilets now are, doing, are uh, obsolete. But there were many millenniums before this handy piece of technology was developed, I don't know when it's going to be developed, and so the usual hand-wringing went on for a very long time. Besides, there was still a lot else about the body that didn't sit well with humans. They're all their internal organs, their blood and so forth. They felt abused and victimized and full of self-pity, as if they were the hapless targets of a cosmic joke in exceptionally poor taste. I am trying, queasy reader or queasy hearer, to cut through the numbing effect of custom, to make the familiar unfamiliar. Just because something is an inescapable fact of life, as old as life, as old as life itself, doesn't mean that it has no power to disturb and shock. In fact, the nerve of disgust seems to stay sharp and focused here, not to dull and weaken, even with, with respect to our own excessively familiar bodies. But it isn't so easy to grasp afresh what a strange predicament we find ourselves in, because we're just so used to it, that's our very being. Let me then try another way to bring the scent more pressingly to our nostrils. Suppose you were housed from birth in something like the Matrix, and Richard just referred to something I wrote about the Matrix, so I'm gonna make another use of that. So imagine you were housed in something like the Matrix. Crucially, in my version of this, you have no information about what kind of body you possess, though you do have experience of a virtual world. You never see, touch, or smell, or taste your body, though you have perceptions of other types of body from dawn till dusk. You just don't have any of your own. Naturally, you develop certain affective reactions to the bodies you experience. Some species disgust you more than others, and you form opinions about what kind of body you would like to possess. Suppose you came to the view that a human body would be the best choice. Aren't I know, but let's proceed with the story. Then one day, by some heroic revolution, just in the film, as in the film, you're released from the matrix and delivered into reality to be confronted by your actual body. And remember, you were ignorant completely of what kind of body you actually had, although you had various hopes about what kind of body you had. You find that you possess not the desired human body, but the body of a worm. Six feet long, mottled, multipedal, slimy, wriggling, foul-smelling, and defecating all over the place. I speculate that you would feel horribly upset and surprised. You never imagined you could be that revolting, given the elevation of your thoughts, your keen ethical sense, your highbrow taste in art. The reality would seem like an enormous affront to your self-conception, your dignity and your peace of mind. I am not a worm, you would shriek. The perceived incongruity between your fine inner self and your ghastly <coughs> bodily inc incarnation would grate and grind and be a terrible burden to bear you would long for the life of corporeal ignorance you enjoyed in the matrix. A godlike mind, such as ours, should not have a worm-like body, with the, with the vertiginous ontological dependence that that implies. But if being a worm would be so shocking, why isn't being a human shocking? What if in the matrix you fancied the idea of having a tiger's body, or a body made wholly of light, or even the body of a sleek and flexible worm? You might have your reasons. Maybe you're relishing the idea of a life lived, lived underground, safe, away from prying eyes. You've never thought that you might turn out to have a human body. You've developed, perhaps, some distaste for such bodies in the Matrix. You've seen some nasty accidents and some horrible diseases <coughs> afflicting human bodies. You're finally liberated and find you actually have the body of a tubby, middle-aged man with a flatulence problem. Remember, you've never experienced yourself as possessing such a body in the Matrix, so you have no prior habituation to it. Wouldn't that be as bad as finding you were a worm? Wouldn't an intelligent, sensitive worm, though hardly in love with its body, respond to the human body as more disgusting than its own, simply because it was more used to the worm body? 
Maybe we're much more disgusting objectively than we think, dulled as we are by familiarity. Maybe intelligent, sensitive tigers would rank worms and human beings as about equal on the disgust scale, right near the bottom, with itself the least disgusting animal and elephants and reptiles in between, and that sounds about right to me, looking at it objectively. We are an ungainly creature with our disproportionate arms and legs, our oddly distributed patches of hair, our wrinkled and folded skin, our small writhing mouths, our abnormally smelly feces, our unreliable orifices, our violent and messy birth process. It's not as if the human body is some huge biological prize given out only to the best and the brightest among biological beings. In many ways, it looks like an experiment that may or may not work out in the long run. The shaky, upright posture, the massively swollen head, and so on. We've got used to it, to be sure, and that doesn't mean it wouldn't be as bad a result in the lottery of the matrix as the worm body. The body of pure light would have been so much better because it isn't organic at all. Its source of energy might be nuclear power, say, not uh, the energy trapped in the chemicals that constitute um, organic tissue. Or we might have preferred one of those shining robot bodies that we have seen strutting about so confidently in the Matrix world. Anything but that bipedal, slab-footed, stiff-backed, unstable-looking, loose-skinned, podgy, partially bald, strange-faced, multi multiply leaking baggage they call a human. My point is that, is that from the perspective of the inner self, our psychological, spiritual side, it is jarring that we are any kind of organic being, human included. What if you really were a divine being? What if you were actually the son of God and well aware of the fact? Uh, Jesus of Nazareth is held by some to be just such a being. Let us, en let us entertain the hypothesis. Jesus grasps his own divine identity clearly. And he also comprehends the nature of God more fully than regular men. His manifest divinity throbs unmistakably inside him. Yet he must suffer the bodily trials of mortal men in general. The defecation, the flatulence, the erections and ejaculations of adolescence, the embarrassing pimples and anarchically sprouting body hair, the runny nose, the sweaty groin. Jesus is literally a god who shits. Wouldn't this strike him as simply ludicrous, a malevolent joke, a bizarre and abominable affront? More than that, wouldn't it produce in him a deep sense of schism and paradox? True, he knows it's the price he must pay to move among us, but it must strike him as an intolerable demotion, an ontological slap in the face. And the, and the disciples must feel it as well, as they live with and worship their divine saviour, who must clean his anus too, just like them. Of course, such unnerving thoughts are deemed by some to be tasteless at best and blasphemous at worst, and I'm sure there are theologies that attempt to exempt Jesus from the contamination of the disgusting. But this very fact attests that a clash of attributes is, in being, is being envisaged here. It is simply not in the nature of the godlike to shit. Jesus could not regard this fact about himself with equanimity, it's the heavy burden imposed by the decision to take on the body of a human being. His greatest sacrifice for us was to adopt the mantle of the disgusting without constantly averting his eyes and holding his nose. The elevated cannot also be the base. The fine cannot be the coarse. The same tension recurs with respect to mortals promoted to the ranks of the semi-divine, monarchs, movie stars, and great thinkers. As everyone knows, Her Majesty the Queen of England Elizabeth II is physically incapable of farting, try as she may. Marilyn Monroe never had a period. Immanuel Kant never picked his nose. Once, I, once idolized, such individuals are placed beyond the sphere of the disgusting. They have become, in our imagination, purified and cleansed. The esteem in which they are held precludes recognition of their mortal filthiness. Angels don't have anuses. And inasmuch as we ourselves approximate to such superior beings, we too experience our bodies as alien encumbrances, betrayals of our dignity and pride. The disgusting is felt as an anomaly in our being. It just shouldn't be there. An image suggests itself. The refined aristocrat, with his exquisite manners, his fine silks, perfume spotless, and his feet, gracious in everything he does, with a filthy peasant strapped to his back, belching, farting, stinking. The aristocrat can never remove this his attached peasant, yearn for that as he will nor can he ever become accustomed to the latter's disgusting ways. They are locked inextricably and inexcusably together. The aristocrat, aristocrat looks down his nose at his incubus peasant, resents him, regarding him with scorn and derision. Look how he ruins the splendid appearance of his manifest superior. If it weren't for him, the aristocrat would cut a dashing and beautiful figure, accepted into all the best circles, 
but the vile peasant is there to stay, an embarrassment, a murder, a, a burden, and a monster. If only he could be kept hidden like some terrible family secret, but that's not feasible. He insists on revealing himself, sometimes at the worst of times. Here is the high-ranking aristocrat discoursing on the fine paintings, paintings in his collection, his eyes lit with inspiration, the picture of elegance and eloquence, and suddenly the peasant lets out a loud and lengthy fart, destroying the effect immediately. The trouble, my fellow humans, is that we are both aristocrat and peasant rolled into one. So we can't pin the grossness on someone else. Our peasant is proximate to the point of identity. It's not merely that we are condemned to be always touching the untouchable, we are the untouchable. It's like the old fairy tale of the prince locked inside the frog. The haughty and handsome young royal finds himself imprisoned inside the, slime, the body of a slimy, warty, cold-blooded, lowly reptile. He longs for release, but only a miracle can work such magic. He must languish for years inside this repellent alien mass. Its essential nature is quite other than his, yet it functions as his de facto body. The final release, as the princess kisses the frog, offers the prospect of escape from the loathsome body, as a body more proper to a prince is substituted, a de jure, de jure body, but that body too has its orifices and leakages and all the rest. The implicit lesson is that our body type is contingently ours relative to our minds, and it too is all too frog-like. The aristocrat and the peasant, the prince and the frog, the human soul and the human body, the same basic theme recurs. Animals don't feel this way. A frog is quite content to be a frog. A tiger has no problem with its felinity. There's no sense of alienation, no dream of release. Animals have no conception of God and no aspiration to emulate him. They have minds to be sure, but these minds do not foster a brooding sense of resentment at the organic. Animals are free of the affliction of disgust towards themselves or others. They feel no incongruity in their nature, no aesthetic or ontological split. Defecation is just one fact of life like any other. The anus is not a locus of embarrassment and taboo. For many animals, indeed, the anus is a focus of interest and pleasure, as are its products. We tend to find this utterly incomprehensible and obscurely blame the animal. Dirty things, we think, that they're sniffing each other's backsides and so on, you know, that's how we talk. Nor is there any ambivalence in animals to, about the sex organs. Animals do not queasily divide themselves into two parts, venerating the one and deploring the other. There's no existential anxiety about their animal condition, nothing to fret and puzzle over. Nor is there any need to conceal their animal nature from each other, for fear of giving offence and courting rejection. Social life is not hedged about with fraught prohibitions designed to protect others from one's less pleasing aspect. The affective life of animals is thus quite different from ours, which is saturated with disgust in its accompanying anxieties and strategies. An animal's life is blissfully free of all such grim and grimy concerns. Animal consciousness is not a filth consciousness. It's customary uh, to express one's conception of the human condition by telling a creation story that dramatizes its key elements, especially the trials and troubles of human life. In that spirit, then, I now offer my own creation story designed to give shape to the abstract picture I'm presenting. It goes like this. In the beginning, we were disembodied spirits dwelling happily in the Garden of Eden. We could communicate with each other, enjoy the, sight, the sights and sounds of nature, listen to music, engage in intellectual inquiry, gossip and tell jokes. Life was sweet, no question. We were also immortal, naturally, and had no fear of death or disease. God had made us this way, with our happiness at the forefront of his beneficent mind. Many centuries had gone by in this calm and civilized manner, with no hint of discontent with our lot. We felt that God had done well by us. This is the pre-fall condition of man. Then one day a rabbit came into the garden and began nibbling on a plant. It was rumored that God had sent the rabbit to us for our amusement. We observed the rabbit nibbling, noticing the way fragments of the plant came off in its mouth, followed by chewing and swallowing as parts of the plant disappeared inside the rabbit's body. If the rabbit were left undisturbed long enough, the whole plant would certainly be consumed. For some reason, this troubled us. Emotions arose in our heart that we had never felt before. We felt a mixture of envy, resentment, vanity, hurt, pride, and powerlessness. This little furry beast could do something we could not do. It could consume. Being pure spirits, we could do no such thing. We could not bite off a part of the material world and take it inside us for our own pleasure and benefit. A rebellious spirit arose in us, as if we had been shortchanged, deprived of our natural rights. How could God have given the rabbit an ability he had denied to us? And it wasn't as if the rabbit was anything special. 
It was just a mindless nibbler, not a self-reflective thinker and rational being, such as we took ourselves to be. We began to wail and cry out to God. Quote, quote, here what we said. O oh, great God, why hast thou given unto the lowly rabbit the power to consume, while leaving us, thy, thy chosen ones, without the means of taking the world into our being and mashing it up? Worse that effect. We wanted, we wanted what he was having. After a few, hours, a few days of this ranting, God got back to us, explaining patiently that the rabbit belonged to another order of being entirely and not one to envy. But we would not be fobbed off so easily, ratcheting up our rhetoric and even turning quite nasty with respect to God's intentions, character, and what not. He grew impatient, informing us sternly that he could easily make us of the same stuff as the rabbit, but that there would be a price to pay. We could retain our intellectual and aesthetic faculties, that was not the problem. We would have to be given a mouth, a digestive tract, and an anus. Whatever, we replied, not thinking very hard. That's us. <laughs> we would also need sex organs, because now we would need to reproduce, and this would require certain insertions and deposits, the exact nature of which he declined to dilate upon. <laughs> that sounded fine, we said. Oh, and one more thing. We would, need, we would have to become mortal, because that's what came with the rabbit territory. We hesitated for a moment, but by now we were so hell-bent on rectifying the injustice heretofore perpetrated on us that we agreed. The deal was made, with God producing a contract from nowhere, with lots of fine print about who would be responsible for the final product, etc. Having signed it, God assured us that the next day we would wake up to become little consumers ourselves. It seemed like pure gain. We get to keep our souls as they were, and we have the bonus of a body that can consume. It seemed like a welcome ontological expansion. And so on the following day, as promised, we awoke with our spanking new bodies, though human, not rabbit. God had been a little bit vague about what kind of body we would get, he said it would work for our purposes. It was a funny feeling at first, sort of heavy and clumsy, but God had done the job well, and we couldn't wait to start consuming. Ambling out into the sunlit garden of Eden, we bit into our first chunks of the world. That red, round, sweet fruit was especially delectable. We salivated and masticated, Paracelsus did its reflexive work, and the mashed fragments entered our eager new stomachs. We were consumers at last. When the rabbit came to join us later in the day, we regarded him with swelling pride. We were bigger consumers than he was. He no longer had something we didn't. It was envy, it was the problem. You see, that's, that's human nature for you. All went well for the first few hours, once you got used to operating the bodily apparatus, though the sight of all that open mouth chomping made a few sensitive souls a touch queasy. The saliva mixing with the pulverized food, some dribbling down the chin and so on. Some people didn't, weren't too happy with that. But then something completely unexpected happened, a strange pressure in the lower regions, uncomfortably close to the formations we now call genitals, as if something inside wanted badly to get out into the open. The nakedness we had been enjoying hitherto suddenly seemed like not the best of ideas as a peculiar premonition began to seize those most afflicted with the pressure. Something highly untoward was about to transpire. Resist the pressure as one might, it steadily mounted, finally becoming overwhelming. Great gobs of stinking brown matter leapt from the lower parts of our recently endowed consumers. Uh, recently endowed consumers. Some of it was solid, some of it very liquid, and it smelt uh, to high heaven. We never saw this happen to the rabbit, and somehow we didn't, we were protected from that. At the same time, a grotesque symphony of farts and moans rent the air, compelled by the foul emanations that, now, that were now streaking down legs, forming steaming piles on the ground, and generally making a hell of a mess of things. The humans had never seen or imagined anything so vile, and it was oozing, in some cases jetting, from their own freshly minted bodies. Some of them, shocked and bewildered, felt a further new sensation radiating their middle portions, and before long, streams of vomit were arcing from their gaping mouths. This new material rivaled the old one for its repulsive quality, and before long, a chain reaction set in, as the recently consumed food was collectively regurgitated in the form of a loathsome stew of food fragments and digestive bowel, bile. I'm sorry. The vomit mingled with the excrement on the ground, polluting everything, reeking horribly. Who was going to clear it all up? No one wanted to go near it, yet it had settled where people needed to walk and talk and sit. Oh, this was a steep price to pay for the privilege of, be of being a consumer. And so the emotion of disgust was felt for the first time, and lo, it was not good. 
Nor was this a one-time occurrence, a fetal singularity, if you like. It recurred approximately every 24 hours. Arrangements had to be made to accommodate it. Life had to be organized around it, and someone had to clear it up. We complained bitterly to God, of course, but he reminded us that he'd warned us about the necessity for an anus. And what did he think was going to come out of it? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh? As he patiently explained, you can't be a consumer without being an excreta. That was just the way it was, nothing he could do about it. Nor was that an end to the adjustments we had to make. The sex was messy too, the associated organs unprepossessing, and the birth process grisly. Inside our bodies were assorted tubes and growths that turned the stomach. The stomach was, in fact, one of them, the things that turned the stomach. The whole panoply of the disgusting was laid before us in short order, where only a few weeks before we had lived a disgust-free life. But still nothing, nothing quite prepared us for our first corpse. Death wasn't the centre of the problem. Indeed, such was the shock of the initial wave of disgust that some humans even welcomed it. It was the dead body itself. Within hours, its inherent disgustingness doubled, tripled, quadrupled. It began to rot, subtly, then riotously. At first, nobody knew what to do. So they just left it where it fell and hoped things would be better tomorrow, another very good human trait. That didn't work at all. So the problem grew worse with every passing day. After a couple of weeks, the scene was indescribable. Then someone had the bright idea of burying it in the garden, out of sight and smell. Someone had to be recruited to do the job or threatened into doing it, but nobody felt very comfortable about the plan. Uh, six feet under seemed too close for comfort for such a repulsive and contaminating object. Again, life had to be structured around taking care of the problem, both practically and emotionally. There was much lamentation and gnashing of teeth, as you may imagine. It wasn't long before we trudged back to God with a petition. <coughs> The sum and gist of which was, send us back to our previous embodied, disembodied state, please, O merciful God. But he was resolute, noting that the contractor stated quite clearly that the transformation was irrevocable. We were to live like this forever unto our children and grandchildren, and their children and gran grandchildren, down through all eternity. With heavy hearts, we returned to our lives as consumers, two-legged bald, two bald rabbits, in effect, and tried to make the best of it. No regrets and all that. But the recollection of our previous life haunted us down through the ages. Somewhere in our species' memory there lingered an apprehension of what life could be like without the body and its depth charge of disgust. This ancient memory showed itself in our mythology, our dreams, our daily sense of the jarring and incongruous in our nature. The age of innocence never quite left our collective imagination. The fantasy of a life without disgust, a pure and uncontaminated life. True, we would have to cease being consumers, and part of our nature still reveled in this awesome power, but the price was so heavy that we could never quite surrender ourselves to that status. We wanted to exist solely in our finer, non-organic mode of being. The rabbit had tempted, tempted us, not the snake, and we had succumbed, but the dream of a purer life never quite left us, and we always felt soiled in comparison. We felt ourselves lower and baser than we, than we ought rightfully to be, as if dragged down by the dead weight of our own organic constitution, immortals in the body of, of a worm, in essence. Our prelapsarian state still echoes in the unquiet recesses of our fallen souls. End, the end. Who's going to ask? Who's going to get the questions? You or me? You yeah. do it. You do it. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, there's a couple of things that prevent me from accept, really accepting your division between the soul and self on the one hand and the disgusting body on the other. There are a lot of people, for example, on campus, maybe even in the auditorium, who wouldn't find internal organs or insects or worms disgusting. Scientists, for example. Um, so I, Uh, two, two separate questions. I'll, I'll talk about the, the second one first. Um, there's a, the, as we use the concept of disgusting, it divides into two categories. One is physical disgust, which I was talking about, sensory disgust. The other is moral disgust. Well, of course, we can be morally disgusted at a person or a soul. 
That, but that's not the same notion. I'm talking about physical disgust which can excite nausea and, and such like, not moral disgust. In fact, my view it is that when we talk about moral disgust, it's a metaphorical extension from the physical case. So I'm not, uh, my view is that the psychological can't be physically disgusting. It can be morally disgusting. But on your first question, I don't think what you're saying is true uh, about scientists, because it's true, of course, that it's possible for a scientist or anybody else to think about bodily organs and not be disgusted. It's another thing to have one of those organs placed on your body, for example, or put next to your food and so forth. Then I think scientists are like everybody else. I mean, I myself have thought a lot in my life about the brain. Yeah, that's just, I, I have just thought a lot about the brain. Once I, was, once I did a publicity photograph in which I was asked to hold a an actual brain in my hands. I felt a little queasy doing it. If it had just come from a body and wasn't just a, de you know, a cold one from a lab, that would have been different. So I think that actually we can't free ourselves so easily from disgust of internal organs, not when they're presented to us and placed on us and contaminate us, might go into the mouth and so forth. Then I think we, we do it. I mean, that, a scientist, a zoologist may be professionally interested in uh, digestion. And so they talk a lot about dung and guava and you know, the way scientologists do. But that, and they're not disgusted when they're giving papers about it. But if you said, do you want some of that dung next to your burger at lunch? They'd say, well, I'd rather not, thank you. Actually, the first half of my book takes up this, this question because one of the features of disgust, A, it's an aversive emotion. It causes you to want to put distance between yourself and the, and the object, and that's its primary function. But it, it also has an attractive side to it, so it's an ambivalent emotion. So often, at least in some cases, we have an attraction to the thing which disgusts us. And that has many forms, some pathological, as we, we would say, and like necrophilia. Others would be normal, like normal sexual behavior. Uh, it, it's very interesting, of course, to analyze sexual desire as an ambivalent emotion in that way. And no doubt, the way we experience it as humans, the disgust element is part of our feeling. I mean, what's obviously true about that, I think, is that we have to overcome a natural disgust with other people's bodies and their orifices and their fluids uh, in order to have sex, which we do, of course, and the various things. We have strong sexual desires, of course, and there's love, too. So that, But normally, we don't want to get close to other people's bodies except, you know, in the, when that kind of desire is impelling us to do it. So I think we have both of those feelings in, in, in all cases. Um, sometimes it's an intellectual fascination, as you, you talked about the, seeing the squash uh, squirrel. Sometimes it's actually an attraction to things, where we a morbid fascina a morbid attraction to something. So I think we, have, we always have both of those elements. It's, but the part of the, uh, what's going on, this is what I didn't talk about today at all, it's in the first part of the book, is uh, it, disgust is actually a complex and sophisticated emotion. It's not just like a reflex. Animals don't have it, children don't have it. It's a very top-down, cognitively penetrated type of emotion, very culturally sensitive, uh, depends on the way you conceive its object. So it's never a simple matter to say, this thing is in itself disgusting to everybody. There's always a very complicated set of reactions to it. Um, but the, uh, I think you also were concerned about the idea of whether the soul was a non-disgusting area, um, as well as the, the point that the body can be. I mean, also, my position is not that the body is in every way disgusting. Because if you remember I said at the beginning, the extendedness of the body isn't, the movement of the body isn't. So it's not true that everything about the body is disgusting. So only certain aspects of it are. The ones which we could, say, relate to life in that general way. And that has to do with... You know, things like digestion and uh, the way the blood circulates in the organs and, and so forth. Uh, it, but the, on, the, on the mind side, it's just the same point I, I was making before to him. It's, we have to be careful about distinguishing physical disgust from moral kinds of disgust. So I don't want, not, we're not physically disgusted by somebody's evil intentions or, or anything of that kind. We don't vomit when we're confronted by such intentions. Does that answer your question okay? 
I mean, it's, I agree with you. I mean, <coughs> we do have that ambivalence. When you say configurations, yeah, I mean, he's, he's wondering what he, whether, what he calls bodily configurations. Some of them we find disgusting, some we find uh, attractive or even beautiful. But we, when you say configurations, you may, you may be, mean by that anatomical configurations or you may mean motor configurations, like movements. I wasn't... Anatomical, anatomical. Yeah, I mean, some aspects of the body we don't find disgusting and some we do. Even... Uh, Organs of the body, though, let's take the eyes. I discuss, in the first part of my book, you see, I discuss all of this, and then I apply it to this, I didn't, so I didn't talk about it today. Take the eyes. Of course, we gaze into the eyes of the, of the beloved. We don't find it difficult to look in other people's eyes. We don't think it's like the anus. The eyes are not like the anus in our, in our thoughts. Tears are not regarded as disgusting, uh, whereas mucus is regarded as disgusting. Earwax is also, these are things I didn't talk about today. Um, so certainly, some aspects of the eyes are not. And it's a very interesting question, why is that? that we regard the eyes in that way. And that requires a theory of what makes a, a stimulus disgusting, which I have, which I didn't talk about today. Um, but there's a theory about what it is. I, mean, I can tell you what it is, not a, a secret. It's to do with the connection of the object, uh, be connection between the object and um, life and death, particularly death. Uh, that's, the, that's the basic theory. But I, that would take me many, a long time to develop that, that idea. What's notable about the eyes, though, this is why I wanted to brought up that example, is although we find them non-disgusting most of the time, they can become disgusting, and they can be disgusting without too much change. For example, it's very disgusting to think of slicing an eye and the internal jelly being released. Tears, although they're not disgusting, can become disgusting if they're the result of disease and so forth. So if an eye, a person's eyes are running in a diseased way uh, and stay too long in the face, then that turns to disgusting. That's because of disease, and that's why it's connected to death. So there are many things, there are many subtle questions to be raised. For example, there's another question you, you could have raised. Again, I discussed all this at the beginning of the book. Uh, hair. Hair on the head, we find beautiful. Uh, hair, if I have hair on my head, I have much hair on my head these days, but if you have, have good head of hair, it's beautiful. But if, even if the most beautiful woman with a beautiful set of hair had hair growing from the middle of her forehead in a tuft like this, or the cheek like this, whoa, that's not good, right? <laughs> now suddenly the hair is disgusting. Why? It seems paradoxical that that should be so. That's why philosophically it's such an interesting subject because why should we find some of these physically rather similar things disgusting and some not? That's why it's, much, it's a very sophisticated emotion de depending on various conceptualizations. That's where the, the life and death business comes into it. Clear in the back of the mic. Um. I just wanted to ask, uh, why do you think human beings are disgusted in the first place? Because um, the only thing I can think of is an evolutionary explanation. Uh, like the reason why we're disgusted by rotting food or a rotting corpse is because um, that those things could make us sick and eventually die. So evolutionarily, it's beneficial for us to stay away from those things. And that's the only reason I can think of why we have this capacity for disgust. But do you think there are other reasons besides that? I, I really only got about a third of what you said there. I don't know whether you heard him better than I did. My hearing is not wonderful, and I couldn't understand what you were saying most of the time. Um, I was just saying, uh, the only reason I can think of, of why we have this capacity for disgust... Why we have a... a ca capacity for capacity disgust. Capacity for disgust, okay. Evolutionary. Um, is, is an evolutionary okay. explanation. Uh, like for anything rotting, like a rotting corpse or rotting food, the reason why we feel disgusted is because it could make us sick and eventually die, so... Would make uh, us what? Sick and die. Yes, yes, obviously, yeah. But I mean, this is, the, yeah, this is Darwin's original theory. Darwin had the, the toxicity theory of disgust. His idea was that um, we find stimuli on objects disgusting if they're bad for us, they cause death, they cause uh, ill health, and so forth. That was his early theory. It, it, it's not a good theory because it's neither necessary nor sufficient. Some things are poisonous without being disgusting because chemicals, gases, are not disgusting, but they're poisonous. On the other side, we find things disgusting which are not bad for us. So nearly all cultures have got prohibitions against which animals should be eaten. So in our culture, 
we, we, wouldn't, we would think it disgusting, and we often will say this about other cultures, they eat worms, they eat maggots, they eat these things. Um, and they eat, uh, you know, religions have various prohibitions about which animals should be eaten. So they're not, it's not to do with the fact that you regard certain animals as bad for you, in the sense of physically bad for you. The disgust arises not from such a primitive uh, biological response, but from more cognitive ideas. So it's not, so it, it, some psychologists have written about this, have made the point, I think, correctly, that the most plausible theory here is that disgust originated as a toxicity detector, but then it really developed with culture and with cognition and extended way beyond that. So the emotion of disgust as it exists now in humans has really gone very far beyond merely that. Yeah. Um, I think you're asking about uh, our, the nature of our attitudes towards secreted substances. And here again, I discussed this in the first part of my book. I didn't talk about it today. But let's take blood as an example. If you, when blood is inside somebody's body, we don't have a problem with it. Even mucus, we don't have a problem with mucus inside somebody's body. Once it breaks the body's surface, then things change. And most of these substances have that, that characteristic. Why is this? Why do we somehow, the, why is it when it's inside it seems fine, when it's outside it seems bad? I think the answer is because inside it's part of the life process. It indicates life, living, and so forth. When it's outside, now it's moving towards death. So if you, for example, cut yourself and the blood starts to come out, you, now you're moving towards death. When it's inside, it's a life. It reminds you of life. When it's flowing, it reminds you of death. And so things are like that. So when, when a substance leaves the body, it leaves behind its role in as a sustainer of life, and it becomes m much more to do with death and how we think of decay and so on. Because when these substances leave the body, they also rapidly decay and become food from bacteria and, and so forth, which inside the body they don't because of the immune system. It's much the same with uh, excrement, of course. We're not so worried by thinking, no, even Jonathan Swift not so worried about the excrement inside Cecilia. Because there it's part of the body's process of life. Outside Cecilia, though, it's, now it's a different story. So I, that's the basic uh, thing I would say about uh, secretions. I enjoy this. Um, do you ever give talks on positivism? And also, do you know what the science of pneumatology is? I do give talks on positivism uh, every now and then. It's part of every analytic philosopher stock in trade to talk about positivism. And of course, I've got many views about it. Uh, pneumatology, I don't know what that is um, at all. It was taught at Harvard University last century. It is called the science of communication with spiritual beings. Oh, I see. Now, I don't know anything about that. David, do you have a question? Yeah, very quickly. I'm just going to shout. Um, You're very e easy to hear. I can hear you very easily, yeah. You said something about moral disgust and how that was a moral, yeah. metaphorical yeah. Um, extension. All right. um, I was wondering, um, where would you put something like aesthetic disgust, finding something ugly? Uh, when you were talking about hair on the face, that struck me as something that one might describe as ugly or more disgusting. It just, yeah, it, uh, the, the uh, two... Uh, right. The two, the two categories are very, very close, but they are distinct from each other. I think you're right to point that out. Uh, it, sometimes the misplaced hair will seem to us merely ugly. Other times it might become disgusting. I see a lot of people feel that a lot of hair on the back of a man now goes towards the disgusting, and away just from the ugly. They say, well, it's not that it's ugly, it's just gross, they would say. So in some cases it's one, it's one some cases it's the other. I, 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 my theory would try to explain that generally. I think actually it's to do with uh, various um, growths on the body, such as warts and pimples and other things, are felt to be quite disgusting because they're, they're indications of disease. And I think hair on the body looks like it seems like an alien parasitic organism. But if hair on the body does not strike you that way, but in some other way, then it might only be ugly. There's a whole, you're raising a, a, actually a question which has been discussed by, by 
certain people of the role of the disgusting uh, in the arts uh, and whether and the role, the role of the ugly in the arts too and what, whether it has a place in the arts and in fact the ugly has more of a place than the disgusting and so generally the arts have avoided the disgusting and it's quite easy to see why because if you produce an artistic work that occasions disgust in the viewer that's the exact opposite of what you're trying to achieve at least on classical notions of art modern notions of art you know like Damien Hirst and so on which are trying, trying to you know, rebel against classical notions, bring disgust objects to the fore and call them art. But of course, the very, that confirms this idea that there's an inherent antipathy between the aims of art as an aesthetic thing, where beauty is the object, and including disgust materials as the, as the vehicle of that, of that art form. A final question with Mike? Um, yeah, so can you hear me all right? Yeah. OK. So you said earlier that um, disgust is a rather complex emotion that involves cognition. And I was thinking about um, two particular cases. So I was thinking, well, it seems like with rotting flesh or you know, human corpses and things like that, I'm not sure that I could ever not be disgusted by that. Right. right? But it seems like something like, well, the fact that in Italy people eat horse. Right. right? I mean, I'm pretty OK with that. Right. When I first moved to Germany a couple of years ago, I found that very disgusting. and then. I, Came very okay. So it seems like there are probably two different notions of disgust here, right? So it seems like disgust might be two different types of emotion. One which is kind of like a basic emotion, right? That can be kind of traced to this, this, uh, this evolutionary story really explains it quite well. And then another one that does involve cognition, right? So I just wonder if you think that all emotion or all disgust is essentially cognitive, or if there might also be a type of disgust that doesn't involve any type of cognition. I think all disgust is cognitive. There's another reaction, though, of rejection, which might not be cognitive. Rejection to a, a, a substance which doesn't taste good, for example. So animals would have that. But disgust, I think, that that concept picks out the special uh, human emotion. Again, I discussed this in the first part of my book. I think there are three, three fundamental categories, three basic cases. Uh, rotting flesh, feces, and wounds. Those are the three basic cases. I think you can see all of those under the, under the umbrella of death and, or life in death. Then what we have is a kind of spreading out from that basic case into other cases which are derivative from those cases. So I just mentioned an example, mentioned say things like warts or acne and so forth. That's, that's a, I think, a kind of extension out from things like wounds or you know, growths that come from disease or deformity and so forth. Then there are things which, are, which come out from there. And similarly, I think, with um, the other two categories. So we move out from the basic case. So, if, for example, we find rotting fruit quite disgusting. And I think that's because the ba it's like the basic case of the rotting body. So those cases, I think, are more closely tied to our, to our biological rejection mechanisms. But I don't think you want to explain them in those terms. The others just extend out from there. But then there's the third category, though, is the analogical, metaphorical use, the moral use of it. But I think you, you definitely want the kind of complexity that you're drawing attention to. So the first challenge in trying to give a theory of disgust is isolate the basic cases, trying to give something which unites all of those, and I think you can see how to do it with the, disgust, with the death idea. Then you try to explain the more difficult cases, such as, for example, certain animal species. Why are we disgusted by maggots and rats? Well, now you can connect rats with disease, and maggots be, can be connected with uh, rotting corpses and so forth. So you, you explain them in those, uh, those cases in those kinds of terms. So the ultimate theory is going to be quite complicated, have many cultural factors in. Some of it will be quite plastic and culturally relative. Uh, the, the hope of the theory is whenever somebody finds something disgusting in whatever culture, that emotion will arise from some conceptual connection between some basic idea like death in life or life in death. That's the way that has to go. It's quite a difficult project, actually, philosophically. That's what attracted me to it to begin with, because um, it's very difficult to find a formula which covers all and only discussed objects, because they're so heterogeneous with each other. So, well, let's thank our speaker again, and for really terrific and interesting talk. Thank you.